I'm John Carrington, and we're here on Top of the Morning, and this is... I'm Sylvia Lawis. Welcome. And, and we have a lot of great ideas and information for you. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. Every year during our television fundraiser, Children's Miracle Network Hospitals celebrate hope and healing. Thanks to your generous donations, sick children can get better. So please join me, Marie Osmond, with my co-founder, John Schneider, and other celebrity hosts as we share moving stories of children in your community who need your help. Tune in and celebrate hope and healing and give to your children's Miracle Network Hospital. Oh, wow. Welcome back. And we're here at the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. I'm John Carrington, and... Sylvia Lawis. And we're going to talk about the center. Uh, what's your first impression of the center, Sylvia? Well, as soon as I walked in this morning, I'm like, wow, all these great ladies in history. Unbelievable. Uh huh. And my mom and grandmom probably made some contributions to my life that I have no, no knowledge of. But here we have a host of information and uh, biographies and items that relate to women who've made a compact impact on the lives of everybody here in Maryland. Yes, we also have an astronaut lady that um, came from Baltimore. Oh, oh, that's Dr. Mary Cleave. But one of my favorites is Harriet Tubman. Yeah, she was great, wasn't she? Oh, she led people to freedom. That's right, she at, sure was. At the risk of her own freedom. Yeah. And that's the greatest sacrifice you can make. Here, thanks. let's take a look at this. The Underground Railroad. The desire to help slaves escape bondage led to the formation of the Underground Railroad. There was no real train loaded with escaped slaves traveling on rails underground. The train was a human train of slaves called a freight, led by a guide called a conductor, moving secretly underground to homes called stations of sympathetic people who would give encouragement until they made their way into freedom. Blacks and whites participating in the Underground Railroad movement helped thousands of blacks obtain their freedom. Harriet Tubman was a conductor of the Underground Railroad. south to the north to freedom. She went back and forth to, into slavery owning territories to rescue people. Now some of the people didn't want to go. They, they were comfortable where they are. But those who sought freedom went with Harriet Tubman. And she had a uh, few rules that she made them follow and, and she carried a gun and she never had to fire that gun. Why? Because she used her brain, your most effective weapon. That's right. Let's go ladies. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back with more. the Maryland Heritage Women's Center and I'm John Carrington and I'm Sylvia Lowers and we're talking about the great women who have had an impact on our history uh, Clara Barton that name jumps into my mind the American Red Cross uh, that that whole scenario with the American Red Cross came out of the Civil War uh, men were dying on the battlefield some were injured and of course Clara Barton made a contribution to saving lives and of course that was the foundation that created the American Red Cross 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. The Red Cross is important. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's take a look at this. And of course, uh, I love uh, talking about Clara Barton because there's so much that I've done as a child growing up in the school system with the American Red Cross. I remember getting a little white button with a red cross on it, and, it, and you gave a dime that's or a nickel, right, yeah. and, and you got that uh, little cross. And that's, that's always a wonderful feeling that you did something to help somebody else. Yeah, they're really great when it comes to the, like natural disasters and all that sort of stuff. They're always around to help people finding new um, accommodations and all that kind of stuff, you know? Uh, oh, and, and let's talk about the blood supply as we come back from a break. All right, another, another favorite of ours is uh, Rachel Carson, a uh, wonderful woman. Uh, I don't believe she's related to uh, Benjamin Carson, is she? I'm not sure, actually, if she is. I know Ben Carson is yeah, famous. You know. A famous neurosurgeon yes, over at Johns right. Hopkins Hospital. <laughs> No, 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 Sylvia. I was just kidding. You see, Rachel Carson is not related to Benjamin Carson. Okay. Uh, she wrote a book called Silent Spring in which she described the dangers that we are imposing upon the environment. Uh, she was, uh, I guess, our first official tree hugger. <laughs> she loved the environment so much she wrote a book to help us to uh, uh, learn more about protecting our environment. Let's take a look at this. But you know, she suffered uh, because the time that she worked in environmentalism uh, was in the 40s and women weren't looked upon as being experts on much of anything and, and of course that was a very prejudicial approach to uh, treating women who had something to share. 
But uh, let's take a break and we'll be right back with more. Hey, welcome back. I'm John Carrington. And I'm Sylvia Lawless. And I'd like to talk about Eugenie Clark, a woman who uh, loved deep sea diving. Uh, she was almost like a Jock Lasso of the female gender. I mean, well, that, whatever that meant. <laughs> <laughs> she loved the oceans and the uh, sea creatures that lived there. And uh, there's a lot of information right here. And of course, we love talking about these women who've done so much for so many people. Uh, let's take a look at this right here. I don't think I ever consciously wanted to be an explorer. I didn't know what an explorer was. I just knew that I wanted to study fish. And it was when I went to the old aquarium at Battery Park in New York. And I, I just thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could spend the rest of my life studying fish and actually go in the water with them and see them underwater as you could, as I'd pretend I was underwater when I looked into the tank, especially the one with sharks. And I guess in order to do that, I would have to go out into the world and underwater, and uh, I guess that was exploration, but I didn't call it that at that early age. And my parents would say, well, maybe you can study typing and how to be a good secretary, and you can become a secretary to somebody like William Beebe. That would be exciting, wouldn't it? And I said, no, I don't want to be anybody's secretary. I want to do that stuff myself. I want to be like William Beebe. No, well, well, I was brought up in an age where <laughs> Jaws hadn't come out yet, and, uh, and I didn't think of them as, as vicious animals because they don't look like it when you watch them in an aquarium. They've got big teeth, but then so does your dog. My first encounter with the shark underwater was in the Palau Islands. Um, I was swimming and along came a great big shark and I looked at it and it was just so beautiful and streamlined and it didn't pay any attention to me. It just swam by and went down the reef. Maybe it was seven feet long, maybe eight. But they look larger underwater. All things look about a third larger. On May 4th of the year 1922, a girl named Eugenie Clark was born, later known as the Shark Lady. Eugenie was raised completely by her mother Yumiko due to her father's death when Eugenie was just a baby. Eugenie grew up in New York, which is where her interest in fish began. When her mother took her to the Battery Park Aquarium in New York, she immediately became fascinated with the fish and started to visit the aquarium regularly. Her interest in fish grew stronger over the years, and she decided she wanted to make a career out of it. She attended Hunter College and earned her bachelor's degree in 1931 for zoology. Clark later earned her master's degree in zoology from the New York University in 1942. 
After earning her master's, Eugenie was hired at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to study fish in the Philippine Islands. However, she only reached Hawaii until she was denied by FBI clearance. She then returned to New York to work on getting her doctorate at NYU. During that time, she also worked at the American Museum of Natural History. In 1949, she began her travels in the South Pacific to study fish for the U.S. Navy. In 1950, Eugenie received her Ph.D. in zoology from the NYU and also received a Fulbright scholarship to study fish in the Red Sea. She became the first woman to ever work at a marine biological station in Egypt. Clark spent the next year there collecting specimens. She used fish poison and learned spearing techniques to obtain some of her specimens. She even discovered three species that were previously unknown. Clark wrote an autobiography titled Lady with a Spear that was published in 1953 and became a bestseller. She became the founder and executive director of Cape Hayes Marine Laboratory in Florida in 1955. In 1968, Clark was given a position as a professor at the University of Maryland College Park. Eugene has given over 60 lectures to colleges and universities in the U.S. Over her years of hard work and research, she became a world-famous scientist in scuba diving for research. Clark has been diving with sharks for over 30 years. She is active in scuba diving research on fish and submarine dives. Clark's interest in sharks grew increasingly when she received a call from a scientist who needed shark livers for his cancer research. She collected tons of shark specimens so that they could be dissected or cut apart. She cut up the stomachs of more than 1,500 dead sharks to learn what they ate and found out that they consumed many types of fish including crabs, eels, octopuses, and other sharks. Clark wanted to find other ways to study sharks, so her and a few other scientists built pens next to the dock, which they used to trap the sharks, and Clark would study them from inside the tank. Clark discovered that sharks are capable of learning. Eugenie was able to teach the sharks she had in captivity how to hit a target and receive food. Eugenie has written books, articles, and scientific journals, given lectures, and had specials on television about her research. She has received multiple awards for her accomplishments. Eugenie discovered lots about shark anatomy, physiology, and behavior from her research, earning her the name the Shark Lady. Wow! Whoa! Yeah, wow. She was an adventurous wow, person. Wow! I she, might try that one time. I'm like an Indiana Jones of the ocean. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Looks fantastic. Uh huh. Oh my goodness. Well, there's so many other fa fascinating people uh, around it. Have you noticed any names and faces that uh, relate to some of the experiences you have had? Um, there is one over there in the corner there of the exhibit with the women's suffrage. Oh, uh, with the ladies. That's uh, Ida, not Ida, Ida B. Wells. Uh, that's um, the woman who ran for public office uh, to Susan B. Anthony. That's, Susan, yes, yeah, I she's on our think money. Of the name. That's yes. right. Yeah, but she did. Well, yes, but well, see that that statue with the clothing on it represents yeah. the women's suffragette movement. Exactly. Uh, women didn't get the right to vote until way after the slaves got their right to vote. And of course, uh, that was a, a travesty of American history. But the suffragettes made sure that women got their rights. So yeah. let's, let's take a break and we'll be right back with more. Okay, welcome back. I'm John Carrington, and you're still. I'm Sylvia Lowes. <laughs> still, <laughs> yes. And, and and as you walk through uh, the exhibits here, you see a picture of a woman by the name of Rebecca Hofberger. I know her. I know her. <laughs> it's funny. so nice to have some living legends represented exactly, here. Exactly. Yes. And Rebecca Hofberger is the um, the founder and creator of the American Visionary Art Museum, which is located in Federal Hill. And it's a beautiful museum. It gives artists a venue to share what they do. And, and what they do is take artistic license. Uh, they're people who created uh, art out of uh, 
lint from the uh, dryer. That's right. Old Lots parts of different things. from the uh, junkyard and put it together, welded it together mm. to create art. That's right. And so much of what we think is art, you know, we think it's got to be oil and, and, and this and that. No, no, no. Creativity can come in many forms, and that's what's represented at the American Visionary Art Museum. Uh, so many times Rebecca Hoffberger will speak about the museum, but she always speaks in terms of how humans have so much to express, and not all of it is in words. No, you can just do it like, you know, a fork and a knife, and you put it together, and it's a little mobile of some sort. Exactly. Exactly. And for example, you're an, you're an actor. Yes, and, correct. And so as you perform, you create. Yes. And it's not all the time from a script, it's from what's inside of here. Exactly. And let's take a look at this. Okay. Good morning, I'm Steve Isaiah. This is Top of the Morning. We're here this morning at the American Visionary Museum with Rebecca Hoffberger, founder and director, executive director. I want to make sure I get this right. Okay, good. We have a very special conference this morning. You're going to love what you see. Would you tell us a little bit about what our viewers are going to see today? Yes. Um, there are more than 1,500 books written on the end of the Mayan calendar, most of them oriented to fear and destruction. And I thought it was very important to have a conference at the very beginning of 2012, gathering the prophetic traditions from all over the world uh, to be able to bring them here and speak from their hearts what their ancestors have said about these times and then have the top, most caring, most passionate environmental scientists speak about the state of our world. There's no preaching today, there's just simply statement of fact. For example, um, Dr. Susan Shaw is the foremost ocean toxicologist and she will bring up that at this point there's not one cup of seawater anywhere on the earth that won't evidence microscopic pieces of plastic. But the way that we have altered this world, now that we're seven billion people, has great implications for all of us. So this is a very love and caring centered conference where we hear people uh, from West Africa traditions, from uh, various Native American, Kiowa, also the Huichol, Peruvian Inca, and even Mayan descendants speak about what they understand where we are as a humanity on this earth at this time. Rebecca, some of our viewers out there have probably read in the mainstream media that the Mayans had a big stone calendar and that it ends in 2012. And a lot of people want to know, does that mean it's the end of the world, or did they just run out of stone? There was no more room to carve any of the dates. I mean, this calendar is, what, thousands of years old? Correct. And it's not, um, it, it, until computers, it was the most uh, accurate uh, uh, form of, of uh, telling time, down to even every eclipse, etc. So the Mayans were very intelligent about how we mark time, even by modern standards. But it's um, just in the same way a new millennium was not the end. Um, this, this end of this age, uh, the, the, the long count is what they refer to it, um, it, does not mean the end of existence. I actually don't think that there is such a thing as an end to existence. I think um, you know, we come as little sparks of the divine, and as parts of the divine, if you're part of something infinite, you yourself are infinite, you know? Um, so I do think there will be big changes because there already have been big changes. We look at Fukushima and the amount of radiation that has gone out. There are, are, are very big concerns. Our, our ocean, our, um, our epi, um, epidemiologist, Dr. Shira Kramer, was mentioning that we now have over 90,000 new chemicals that did not exist on the earth, they are human made. And of those 90,000 new chemicals in our water, our air, our clothing, our soils, our food, less than 2,000 have ever been tested at all. And most of those not on how it impacts in combination with other things, etc. So it's a, yeah, this is a time for just speaking truth and um, doing so very lovingly because we have big, big work ahead of us. We mentioned all these 
chemicals and yes. some that have potential to cause some real problem. Some of our viewers may be saying, well, what can I do? I'm just only one person. What can they do to help in a situation like this? I think there are many things that we can do. And one is really a, a demand that not just to make jobs, that we have an, uh, uh, that we set a standard of, of uh, regulation. This is a great conference, a lot of interesting speakers. What do you hope the outcome is? I think it's the first time that anyone has gathered people who have lived without abusing the earth and who come from an earth-centric, loving culture from all different native peoples with scientists who, with all the modern technology and, and education, <laughs> are just as passionate. We're still about, setting up, folks. Yeah, are just as passionate about what and caring about life for human beings and care and respect for nature. Uh, there's only one Earth, and I think that this today begins an honest dialogue. It is true in the sense of South Africa's a great achievement, truth and reconciliation. And it's not blaming industries. It's saying, let's just find out where we are. As executive director, I know you've got a lot to do and let you go, but how about just a quick plug for the American Visionary Museum? Well, the American Visionary Museum is open to intuition, to listening within, and this conference is a perfect expression. I think it's the most amazing conference we've had in all 16 years of our National Museum being pretty darn Rebecca, thank you very much for your time. We know you have a lot to do. The American Visionary Art Museum, downtown Inner Harbor, Baltimore. Please come down and see it. It is a marvelous place. Rebecca, again, thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Look forward to the conference. Thank you. Well, Rebecca Hoffberg, wow. We're giving you your flowers now. She is so wonderful. She was great. And making such an impact on Baltimore. Well, uh, I've, I've enjoyed my visit here. Uh, uh, what's your impression, Sylvia? Well, there's no words, really. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I've learned a lot, actually. Uh -huh. And you know something? I, I enjoyed working with you because you have this wonderful South Baltimore accent. Yes, uh, I try my best. Am I? <laughs> Not very far, actually. Just from Boston, actually. You know, so. Yeah. You're from South Boston. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You know how they say car. Uh -huh. you know, so. yeah, well, that's ocean yeah. away from where I live. <laughs> I live on the other side of the water, Cherry Hill. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes, I, I know where that is. I actually come from New Zealand, uh, oh, okay. Wellington, New Zealand, the capital. <laughs> um, my mother and father came from Holland, full-blooded Dutch, speak Dutch, and I'm um, living now in Baltimore for quite some time and loving every minute of it. Well, I, I enjoy your accent. You sound so official. Well, thank you. I try. But this is really my accent. Yes, you know how it is. So, so not put on at all. Well, so. I know this is a little different from where I'm from. So. Uh, just, yeah, just a little bit. So it's not too bad. All right. Well, this yeah. is John Carrington. And this is Sylvia Lowes. And we're having a lot of fun. And we want to thank you for watching this episode. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.